Welcome to Legacies, a journey through the interesting lives of elders. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance. This program is a collaborative effort between Cambridge Health Alliance and Somerville Community Access TV. Often, we meet elders and we have absolutely no idea what kind of lives they've led or the experiences that they've had. We thought we would showcase a few elders to share their experience, strength, and hope with you. We hope you enjoy it. Today we have with us Nita Rinye. And Nita, Nita, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming to join us today. <laughs> and you are a resident of Cambridge. And yes. how long have you been in Cambridge? Since 1984. 1984, so that's yeah. a year or two. Y yes. Yeah. Quite a long time. I was a senior citizen, no, almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> and now, do you want to tell us how old you are? Uh, well, I'm 92. I'll be 93 in June. So almost 93. Yes. And, and you are, um, it, let's, let's talk a little bit about your life that you've had and, and uh, where you were born. Where were you born? I was born in Detroit, but I was conceived in Windsor on the Canadian side of the river. And whenever one of us, I was one of three, the middle of three, and uh, when we were to be born, we, we crossed the river in case we were born boys and could be president of the United States. Oh. But we were born girls, so it was it useless. It didn't matter. Yeah. It was a moot point. Yeah. So were you born an American citizen? Yes. In Detroit? Yes. Yes. And so your family came from Detroit? Yes. And you went to school? At the University of Michigan. Oh, yes, I went to Canadian schools until university. And then I went to University of Wisconsin for a year, and then the University of Michigan. And then um, what, what and you majored in? My major field was... Uh, Political Science and Modern European History. And that your was, minor was? And the minor was Russian Area Studies. Russian. Unbelievable. Yeah. Right. And so then uh, you went to work after, after school? Um, not immediately. I went to the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, for, uh, intending to get a master's degree there. Okay. And I stayed for one semester and discovered that my master's degree would not make me a diplomat or a spy, which was what I wanted. It would make me a librarian at the Library of Congress. Which didn't please you. No, which was not part of my plan. So I took my second semester tuition money, and I took a freighter as far from home as I could get which was chilly because war shipping rules were still on and I could not go to Europe or any place um, more romantic. So, but I thought, I thought Chile was good because nobody went to Chile. Everybody went to Rio, Bing Crosby and, and Bob Hope went to Rio and, and B.A. Buenos Aires, but nobody went to Chile, so that was good. And it turned out to be the most beautiful country in the world. Oh. And where did you work beautiful. when you went to Chile? I got a job. But the bet was that I wouldn't be able to stay a year. So I did win the bet. I got a job at the um, uh, uh, Chilean American uh, Cultural Center teaching English, teaching English, which was all that I knew at that age. Uh, How old were you at this well, time? Well, I was 22 mm -hmm. by then, but a, a degree in modern European history doesn't get you very many jobs. <laughs> so, but I could speak English, and I taught English there uh, for a year, and it was tremendous fun because when I arrived, I didn't know any Spanish at all, and I had to demonstrate the verbs, like to trip or, you know, to run. And the university boys liked me a lot. They liked to give me verbs to demonstrate. Oh, so, <laughs> they challenged you. Yeah, 
Yes. So my classes were big and well attended. And did you learn Spanish? Yes. You did? Oh, within three or four months. Yes. I had to. Had yes. to. Yeah. So you yeah. picked that right up. Yeah. yeah. And I enjoyed it very and, much. And how long did you work in Chile? One year. One year. And then what? Then I came back to thinking Detroit? that I would be king, you know, queen of the world because I had done something so wonderful uh, to my mind. And uh, well, it was pretty adventurous, especially in that day and age. Yes, in 19, it was 1940, February 46 when I went. So that was soon after the war. Right. And uh, it was a wonderful time to be traveling. Nobody was homogenized. <laughs> Americans looked Americans, and Chileans looked Chilean. Everybody looked like who they were. Right. And it was quite wonderful. That was wonderful. And so what? So then I came back, and um, I thought I would have a village period, and I would um, I would run around. I would have a, have an apartment in the Greenwich Village, and I would go for long walks at night, um, reciting poetry to myself. So you came back and went to New York. Yes. Because I had, by now, if, you know, there was no way I could go back and live with, at home mm -hmm. because I had done something that I had to keep my reputation going, you know. And your adventure. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, by then I wanted to see everything, do everything. Right. So I, I went to New York and... Um, I finally found a, after a number of different tries for about a year, I got an apartment on 12th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue, which is very adequate. It was $52.50 furnished a month. Wow. Oh, yeah. And it was one room and a tiny kitchen. So that was fine. And eventually, after a number of different jobs, I got a job teaching English at Queens College, mm -hmm. which was a commute. It's on Long Island. And it took Did quite a while to get by there. by uh, transportation, mass yes, transportation? Yeah. Yeah. Public. Lots of, lots of going. I, I did have a, a more difficult geographically job before that on Staten Island, and where I had to take a ferry in the winter. But this was, this was nice. This was... Uh, Queen's College, and the last, so I was altogether three and a half years. At Queen's? At, no, at, in New York. Oh, in New York. For my village period. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> let's see, at Queen's College, I realized that people, girls, under, you know, should not have a village period that lasts more than about three and a half, four years. It's a, either stifling or, or murderous or something. It's not a good thing. So I decided I would have to have a West Bank period. And that would be in Paris, because now Paris was accessible. Well, let's back up a little oh, bit. Back up. Because when you were a professor at, oh, yes. at Queens, oh, yes. um, you had you were teaching. The most uh, important thing, yeah. yeah you were teaching um, people. Older adults with advanced studies? Yes. Not, yeah. not younger, younger yes. ones? Yes. Mostly I was teaching foreign students who came to get master's degrees and doctorates, ah. you know, but mm -hmm. who, whose English, for especially the Fulbright students, the Fulbrights we had as a special group. They were just beginning, and uh, what was special about them was that their English was essentially pretty good, mm -hmm. but they had British ears, and they did not understand one word that Americans said. They do, even though they speak the English language, it yes. is different. But their diphthongs, their vowels, everything comes out differently. Different. You know, well, you've, you've seen that on BBB, BBC shows, you know. Right. Sometimes it's very hard to understand people on, on uh, 
Downton Abbey or something like that. True. So, uh, so t let's talk, talk about one of your students. Who oh, one of my students. Okay, so we had Fulbrights. Mm -hmm. And they Which were, is a very prestigious program. Yes, it was very, very good. And they came usually for a year. Mm -hmm. And they were people who had already finished university mm -hmm. and uh, beautifully intelligent and interesting, uh, but didn't understand American English. So we uh, mostly, uh, we were assigned a class, our eight to nine class. And they were our advisees. Mm -hmm. And I used to invite my eight to nine class to my tiny apartment on 12th Street. And I'd make them um, spaghetti. Cause, and we would, and I'd let them play my guitar. And, uh, and I would be nice to them and tell them how to read a newspaper, how to fold it so they could read it standing up on the metro, on the, right. on the uh, uh, IRS or whatever. And we were just to, had to be nice and talk to them a lot mm -hmm. so they'd hear our, our American pronunciation and singing. And uh, so Jerome was in my last class of Fulbrights uh, that summer before I decided to leave. And he was very nice. And he sat in the back row. And he, he Dr. Van Hoek, you know, and all the fancy people sat in the front row and paid attention. <laughs> and Jerome sat in the back row and folded paper chickens <laughs> of various sizes, big ones down to very little ones. And I would watch him, and all the time I'd be trying to improve people's American pronunciation. And Jerome appeared to listen, but he was very busy with his paper chickens. And I thought, well, he's a problem. <laughs> and then uh, he called me up one day. I'd given my advisees my phone number in case they had problems. And he called me up and he said, uh, Miss Carite, uh, I'm at the Museum of, Mo of Art and my aunt is hanging here, so I wanted to see her. And would you be interested in meeting me and see, also to see my aunt who was hanging here? And I thought, well, that was pretty irresistible <laughs> to see his aunt, you know? I mean, where was she hanging? You formulated it. Yes, a you vision. know, what kind of a thing, you know, the French Revolution sort of thing. And so I, uh, I did go up, and it turned out that it was a painting, uh, I think, done by um, Renoir mm -hmm. of Madame Charpentier in a black dress. And then there are two children, one of them sitting on a dog. The two children, I think, are in little um, blue dresses of some kind. And the one sitting on the dog was Jerome's great aunt by marriage. There we go. So there. So we admired her, and that was my first encounter with Jerome, sort of tete-a-tete, -tete, you know. Right. And, and Jerome turned out to be your... He turned out, then we married. Three years later, we got married. That's sort of the long and short of Three years of it. later. So you were going to, um, you were just about to say that you were going off to France, and Jerome was from France. Yes, he was, yes, he was from, his, his family lived uh, about six miles outside of Paris mm -hmm. in a very big house. Right. And um, so this was still within five years of the end of the war. And so I knew that there were shortages all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And I had three French students, Jerome and two others, in my Fulbright class. And I said, if you want to make packages and give them to me, I'm going on a boat and D-deck, and I will mail your packages when I get there so that I can get them through customs if you want to take chocolate and good things. So um, Jerome said, well, if you're going to France, where are you going to live? And I said, oh, I shall live on the, on the left bank. And uh, 
I shall wear a turtleneck sweater, and I shall be an existentialist, and I shall run around in the streets quoting T.S. Eliot and, and uh, being, you know, being dramatic. And he said, well, if you do that, you will learn French with a terrible accent, <laughs> because the West Bank people have terrible accents. I shall write to my mother. And so he wrote to his mother, and she said, oh, well, we always have room in one corner of the house or another. Send her along. And so I went. You went and stayed with his mother. I went and stayed with his mother. Now, quickly tell us a little bit about that time. In, uh, it was a... Yes, it was February 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, there were in enormous food sort shortages. The only meat that was not... Uh, rationed was horse meat, mm. and you could not buy chicken eggs because they were used to make more chickens. Uh, so you could buy duck eggs, and she, uh, Jerome's mother, in order so that I would learn French f from the beginning, would send me to do all the marketing, yeah. and she'd give me the money so I'd have to learn to count, and then I would go to the market, and it would be a big market day thing, because it was a village, and I had to go and ask for 300 grams of this and 200 grams of that, and so you meat, learned you know, very quickly. Do all these things, and I had to uh, learn the, the names of things and everything. And everybody in the village got to know me, hmm. which was nice, because I became the little American of Madame Regnier, <laughs> and I was five feet eight at the time. July, August, 1944. It, the war went on till 45, but mm -hmm. the the Germans were beaten back, you know. So that uh, it was an SS uh, unit of the German army, which is probably the most feared. Wow. The SS were were considered uh, fearful, mm. and uh, but it was a parade unit. So in the house there were. A uh, hundred men and officers, wow. and there were a hundred and fifty horses, because there was a parade unit not in the house, right. but on the on grounds, because the there were forty acres of park wow. around the house. Wow! And there was a, uh, a stables, and a garage, and there were, and an orangerie, so there were places to put the horses. And she and the family, her children, had to live in, way up in the top yes, of that house? they lived in the very top of a wing of the house, and it had a very high-peaked roof. It was an attic room. Mm -hmm. my, uh, the, my, uh, Jerome's father was in a prisoner of war camp because he had been taken as, in the army, you know, he'd been uh, during the attack on France. and. Um, so it left his mother so and children. She was alone with the five children, mm. and the first thing she did—it's a very high peaked roof. The, it's about thirty feet up to the very peak, and so she got someone to come and hang ropes, hang a trapeze, and a climbing rope from the the peak, so that the children could, could didn't have to go outdoors and mingle with the. Germans. Soldiers who were a little scary, um, and they would uh, fool around on the on the uh, trapeze and the climbing ropes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there were whole, there was a hole in a door that Jerome's foot went through when he was swinging on <laughs> on a rope or something. And there are all sorts of funny stories about 
the that. bad things that kids did on those. But that's where they lived. Right. So, in, was she part of the underground? Did she help? Yes. Uh, everybody in her family was. Uh, she uh, worked on uh, false papers, false passports, false identification papers to get people hiding in Paris uh, out uh, into Spain or out by way of of uh, Italy, you know, Switzerland, Italy, uh, get sneak people out of uh, occupied France mm -hmm. and so that they could get around to England, to de Gaulle, where they could join the Free French Forces uh, in Africa and uh, who were, or who were coming over from England. That's amazing. I mean, there are so many interesting points of your life. Yeah. Um, but let's fast forward a little bit. And you um, were staying with his mo his mother. Yes. And Jerome went he off to Morocco. His, yes, he got his doctorate. Mm -hmm. I mean, he no, he didn't get his doctorate. He got his master's degree in on his Fulbright in the States. And then he came back. In geology, was it? Yes, it was geology yeah. all yeah. the time. and. He had graduated from the National School of Geology in, in France. And then he had to do his military service. Uh, so he did that military service uh, in Strasbourg because the French government will not send uh, a son, uh, 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 it will not send a man to a place where there's any war if. He's already had a brother killed oh, in a war. Yeah. And Jerome's older brother had been in the underground and had been killed, executed, uh, captured and executed by uh, the German occupying forces. Mm -hmm. So uh, somebody had already died for France in right. the family. Right. So he did his mil military duty in a place where there was no, no warfare going on. Mm. Uh, because at that time France was at war in Indochina and things were happening in Algeria. Hmm. So, but they kept him out of there. Uh, the French government did because David had been killed. So he did that for a year and then he got a job with the French Atomic Energy Commission in Morocco. And, and then did he send a letter to you? Yes. He sent a letter that was two-thirds of a page long um, asking me to marry him. And I wrote back 23 pages <laughs> explaining all the reasons why it was totally impossible. Different culture. I was older than he was. You know, it was just so wrong. And uh, he wrote back saying, another letter, half a page long this time, saying, um, uh, I got your letter. It was very long. It's a good thing you put two stamps on it because it certainly was heavy. <laughs> and I have written it. None of it made any sense. So I have written our good news to both our families. So we have only a few more minutes. And yeah. I just want to make sure that we know that he was in Morocco at this time, yeah. and his family sent you to Morocco. Uh, yeah. They bought you a ticket, and you yes. were married in Morocco. Is yes. that right? Yes. And, and just, Maman came. His mother came to our wedding. Wonderful. Yeah. And just a, a little bit about your life uh, with Jerome, and and you and Jerome purchased an island up in northern Ontario. Yes. And then you had wood brought in, and and you and. You had children at that time. Yes, it was. We'd been married ten years, and we had four and three quarters children. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, you had the wood brought in, and you built that cabin. Yes, and yes. you still go up today to yes. visit that that cabin. Is that yes. right? It, so. We we built it without a T square or a level, and so it still stands. It's very agile. Right. And that's an, that's an, that alone is an incredible experience. Yes. But I do want to share with our viewers that you are still at almost 93, and you are still teaching a class at MIT. Yes. Weekly? No, no, every two weeks now. Every two weeks. Started out weekly. No. 
And I think you said that you were going to be taking a class? Yes, in this drawing. Month? In drawing? Yes. Starting this month? Yes, starting Tuesday. Yes, starting very soon. Very soon, right. And yes. so you are still uh, living a productive life. Oh, yes. At, at I hope age so. almost 93. Yes. Now, and Jerome recently passed and yes, he did. In, in September. Yes. And that has been a, um, a, a, a shock and yes. a challenge to you. Yes. To, uh, to go on. We sort of invented each other. So <laughs> my inventor is out of the, you know, that's, I miss him. He's whispering right in your ear. I, yes, I hope so. Right. I well, so. good. Well, I'm sure he's watching right over you, Nita. Thank you so much. I mean, we might we have so much more to tell. We might have to bring you back again to finish your story. But we do have the high points here, and and it just I want to just reiterate that even though you might be getting up there in years and walking this highway of life, and almost 93 as Nita is. Uh, she's still teaching at MIT and still carrying on a productive life. So it doesn't really matter how old you are. We hope you enjoyed this, and thank you for joining us.